Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. Today we have Oriel on the channel from Zengo. And I wanted to bring him onto the channel. We've been planning this for a while so we can talk about Zengo, the wallet uh, for iOS and Android, and uh, just generally talk about the crypto space. So Oriel, welcome to the channel. Well, thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. So for folks that might not be familiar with you, could you give a little bit of background about um, your history in the space, what brought you into crypto, uh, what have you been working on over the years? So uh, as you can see, I have some white hair <laughs> here and there. Crypto will do that. And, and I have a French accent, so you can already position me on the map, right? Like yeah. Age and geography. So, but I'm, I'm based in Tel Aviv in Israel now for the past uh, 16 years. Mm -hmm. I lived some years in the US, in the, in the, the Bay Area, but mm -hmm. I've, I've spent the last 16 years here. I was born and raised in France. I was worked most of my career in tech, in the internet uh, world, both as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and as uh, an investor slash VC. So I've been on both sides and um, I've seen all sorts, uh, but I'm really a consumer uh, guy. Like mm -hmm. I love to build like consumer products, great products right. or invest in great products. And um, I came to crypto extremely late. So I will explain that, how that came. So I'm not very proud of that. I have a bit of shame that I don't have a great... Like, I was there early and I spotted before everyone. Uh, I was I was uh, too dumb to see that. But it happens. I saw, it, I saw it and I went deep and uh, zoomed in. But uh, uh, before that, I did all sorts of things. I built apps that scaled to millions of users. Um, as I was also a blogger. I was one of the very, very early editors at TechCrunch, uh, the, uh, the popular blog, um, mm -hmm. which was sold later on to AOL and blah, blah, blah. Yep. And I created a venture fund also, uh, which is very uh, successful in France, uh, investing all sorts of startups. So I came to crypto after my last company because I didn't know what to do, couldn't find anything interesting. And uh, Bitcoin was already a thing. I mean, it was like three years ago. Yeah. And But it was on my like, dark radar. I didn't want to hear about that. For me, it was like dirty money and whatever. And I heard a podcast of, um, of I think it was Nick Zabo, and that, that basically opened my eyes and it really blew my mind. And I yeah. said, my God, did I miss all of that? And then, you know, the Curiosity Engine started kicking on. And uh, I learned, I learned until I decided to write about it, invest in it, you know, anything about it, until I found an idea that I wanted to spend time on. So Excellent. that was basically three, four years ago. Awesome. Yeah, and I think that story is very common where, you know, if you heard about Bitcoin in the news or in publication, yeah. I guess over the like th three to five years ago, you probably think, okay, well, Bitcoin is, uh, it's just internet crime money, basically. It's gambling. And the you completely miss the the greater value that there is underneath all of that rhetoric. And so I think there are a lot of times where folks just need to sort of step out of the mainstream media sphere, which I think it's, it's honestly gotten better now. I think there's more publications today that are saying, hey, this is still a problem, but there's other stuff that's valuable here. So I guess it's that's a right. mixed bag. That's, and we also have the narrative of like blockchain, but not Bitcoin. Yeah, so which is so funny to me. To kind of distance yourself from it, <laughs> but whatever, I'm not going to, to go down that route. Uh, anyway, now, now I'm obviously deep into it and it's going to be uh, probably the rest of my career because I deeply love it and uh, the team also is like that. So, Excellent, excellent. So I, I think that that kind of brings us naturally to the next question that I wanted to ask you because one of the goals for everyone right now that's working in this space is how can we as a company do our part to help make this technology easier to adopt, how to make it easier for folks to actually use for its intended purpose. And so I would say Zengo, your wallet, is very much oriented towards that. Um, so for folks that don't know what Zengo is, could you give a brief pitch about what your product is? Yeah, so Zengo is a crypto wallet, so yet another wallet. Mm -hmm. There are many of them, but it has a unique capability. It's the only wallet in the world um, that is uh, keyless, meaning so what we call keyless is that it does not ever generate a private key, and it works on all blockchains. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so... Uh, of course, plug to all sorts of financial services that you find typically in a wallet or an exchange. So it's more like a, an app for investment versus, versus a wallet, but you can call, mm -hmm. call that a wallet. And uh, so it's a mobile app that you download on your phone. 
it has a unique uh, sign-up experience because it's uh, the only wallet that is completely, entirely passwordless. There's no password at any moment in, in Zango. Uh, it's uh, not, not unique to crypto. It's unique at all. And uh, in, two, in a few seconds, you set up. You can manage all sorts of blockchains, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tezos, Binance Chain, uh, and others, and more to come. Mm -hmm. You can buy. You can send, receive, of course. And um, we just launched a few days ago uh, saving, so the ability to land or to stake, and all okay. of that in a unique, uh, very simple interface. Excellent. So you say, so when you say keyless, I think people might get tripped. For people that know crypto fairly well and they know, okay, the common adage, not your keys, not your crypto. You want to own your own keys, protect your seed phrase and all that. It's this, this wallet experience runs very counter to that way of thinking, right? Yes. So could you explain uh, to folks watching uh, how a keyless architecture works in terms of transacting? So is it a situation where you're generating an ephemeral key for them, so a temporary key for them to transact on the network and keeping a mapping on your side? Uh, what's happening behind the scenes? So, so, uh, so there's a few things to articulate. So first, uh, Zango is an on-chain wallet, so we okay. do not have custody of the funds. Okay. Um, so that's very important because keyless would be meaning that we would have the funds, and of course, you do not have a private key like an exchange, right? Yes. But this is not the case. We do not have the custody of the funds. Number two, uh, we're using a different stack from the typical public-private key cryptography that you see in basically every single wallet. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are a generator wallet, you're given a public key, right? And you're also given a private key. And then everyone tells you, keep your private key safe, somewhere safe. And if you lose it, you're dead, right? right. So that's basically the message. So in Zango, we never ever generate a private key. We're using a different cryptographic approach, mm -hmm. uh, which we have not invented, but we made highly efficient for the mobile, which is based on multi-party computation. Mm -hmm and threshold signatures. So basically what that means is that instead of relying on a single secret that can be spent in private key, you are distributing the security between different parties and where every single of those secrets are useless in themselves to interact in a cryptographic or mathematical way so that there is no, uh, so, so the transaction happens. So what happens in essence is when you generate, you're creating a wallet with Zango, Different secrets are generated independently, mm -hmm. never in the same place, and they will never be in the same place. And a transaction will be signed by those secrets without meeting each other. But the transaction will be exactly identical to any other blockchain transaction that you find on any other wallet. You cannot see the difference when they are on chain. Mm -hmm. And so the, the layer below is, is, is a bit different. So what that enables is multiple things. First. It's blockchain agnostic, so we can support any blockchain uh, uh, on the planet. Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, we're not constrained like smart contract wallets. We can do only Ethereum or mm -hmm. some wallets that can do only Bitcoin. We can, we can do any, and we already do that. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that it enables you to leverage the power of a server, which in our case, Zango, Zango server, but which cannot be a liability to the transaction because alone you cannot do anything. And you can leverage that power to do all sorts of um, super, super powerful things, mm -hmm. including powering what we call the 3FA authentication, meaning pa passwordless authentication. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that afterwards. Sure. And three, you can create all sorts of very sophisticated financial applications thanks to the power of this server, and which today are not so obvious, but that will come out in the future that are pretty unique to what we can do. So that's Excellent. kind of how it works, more or less. Right. Okay. Interesting. So I think then where people are probably going now, thinking in their head, okay, well, this sounds a lot like a multi-sig scheme, right? It sounds like to send a transaction, you need multiple, um, you need multiple signatures on that transaction, and then. In a recent video, I spoke about Taproot and Schnorr, which are basically aggregate yeah. signatures. Yes. I would say Taproot and Schnorr is very much based off the concept of threshold signatures because you're instead rather than generating two separate secrets, that's kind of where the analogy breaks down. But the aggregate signature creates a valid transaction, which is very that's interesting. Right. So right. for threshold signatures, and I guess that's the core technology that you rely on at Zengo. Um, is your software that generates these 
secrets open source for people to look at? Absolutely. So an entire cryptography from day one is open source. You can check it at github.com uh, under the name of the company, which is KZ Networks, not Django. Mm -hmm. um, the entire stack is open source. It's been it's, it's very popular library, actually, uh, ECBSC library in particular. It's been uh, peer reviewed. It's been audited. The, the audits are public. Uh, we'll do multiple times audits also. So like we're very committed to Good. the security of it. And um, uh, so I want to insist on something that you said. So it's a, it's a form of multi-signature. Mm -hmm. So you're right in that sense, but it has substantial important differences with multi-sig. Sure, yeah. So, so multi-sig first is, um, has to be natively built in a blockchain so you can actually support it. Right? Agreed, yes. So it's natively built in Bitcoin, for example, which is great. So you can have a great multi-sig experience in Bitcoin, mm -hmm. but as you get out of Bitcoin, even on Ethereum, you are very quickly constrained. And there are some blockchains where multi-sig is not even present. Mm -hmm. So, um, threshold signature enables us multi-sig capabilities on any assets. That's number one. Number two, in multi-sig, you still have to generate public and private keys for each and every single party. So, you, you are uh, delegating the, uh, the authentication of, of each party via the private key. So, you have just put a band-aid on the problem of where do I put this private key in a safe manner. Yep. The third problem, which is actually pretty major, is a privacy issue. When you do multi-sig, every single party has to sign publicly a transaction. Yep. And so they expose themselves. You expose the, the signature scheme to the blockchain. Uh, plus, you pay X times the number of fees, depending on the number of parties. So you, you don't have that with uh, multi-party competition and threshold because happening before that the signature is broadcast and you can have an, a high number of parties by keeping the privacy of the scheme and uh, saving all those fees so there is like a lot of interesting properties um, that threshold uh, brings and by the way this is one of the most right now hottest development area in cryptography we're not the only company to do it we're one of the uh, probably the most advanced but there is a lot of companies working on it right now Excellent. Yeah. And, and to your point, that is a big issue with multi-sig. I would say the biggest issue with multi-sig is that it is highly inefficient in the sense that if you have a three of five multi-sig, first of all, all five of those parties have to be known to the chain publicly. And any valid transaction has to have three of five signed, which is expensive and slower and also just a privacy issue in general. So I think that's where the onus is being placed on on Taproot and Schnorr, which I think is better than yes. the original, but it still has to be native. And that's why yes. we'd have to have a soft fork on Bitcoin to do it. That's right. So I, I think the next place that I wanted to go that, that I find interesting is in the crypto space, companies that come up with protocols, that come up with um, applications for wallets, especially for signing, et cetera, people worry and wonder if Zengo disappears, if your servers go down, are we, are our funds lost? Is there a way to recover? What happens in that event? Yeah, they completely lost. We fucked it up. <laughs> yes. No, no, absolutely not. I'm joking. So that was the, um, another thing that we brought from day zero. It's actually not actually very appreciated because you never think about death. Mm -hmm. But it's a major innovation in the entire cryptographic space uh, that we, we brought in from day one. It's what we call guaranteed access, meaning a solution that does not depend on us and that guarantees that 100% of the funds of uh, the users will be available even if we are unable to operate, whatever the reason is. And I can explain what would be the mechanics, but the basic principles is that at least today in this V0 that we have, there are two independent companies, well-known, well-established, in different geographies, that are able, without us, without our server, without anything, to make the funds available to um, every single user to be spent. And they can only do that. They cannot spend it. They cannot do anything. They can just make them available to each original owner. The, the way it works is that one of those parties... Uh, receive every quarter what uh, we call proof of existence, proof of life, mm -hmm. uh, that are both technical and legal. If they stop receiving it and after multiple manual verification, they are able to trigger a recovery process 
that releases back the funds to the user and that so that the user can move his funds without the need of the, the Zango server. So you never uh, you never locked in if there was um, if there was any sort of issue of that, of that nature. Excellent. So just I want to pull on that a little bit more. What are the mechanics behind that process? So obviously you have you know third parties that are that are there to help with the recovery process and they have yeah. they basically have proof that you own funds based on proof of existence attestations. So if someone were to want to go recover funds tomorrow, what would they have to do and what would that process look like? So if if we do if we exist they can recover any time mm -hmm. with a broken phone, we can talk about that later. If we do not exist they have to do actually nothing. They will um, they will receive a notification on their phone. Um, they will be notified that their funds have been uh, have been made available for them to be spent. The code of that is available on GitHub, by the way. So okay. it's not something that we hide. It's there. It's highly documented also in our blog. So we expect every single we explain who are the companies, what they do, when they do it, etc. Uh, and our goal is actually to increase the trustlessness of that by making that uh, through more companies, not just two companies. Right. Uh, we are also, um, we have actually already presented it at Stanford, introducing a social mechanism for recovery. Mm -hmm. So you will be able to rely on the parties of your choice to make that happen. Okay. Uh, if, you want, if you want to choose, so many people don't want to choose. They just want like, uh, you know, convenience, but you will be able to. And so, uh, so the bottom line is that right now you're not locked in if you're going to go away. We're not going to go away. We're here for a long time. Uh, but if, if that was to happen, uh, that's that's there. Yeah, and I think people people worry about that. And for, and for me, especially in this space, it's it gets harder and harder for me to justify products that don't have plans for the inevitability that stuff happens. You know, things happen that you can't control. And in this world, if your code's not open source, people have to just trust you. If you're yeah. If you don't have plans in place, a lot of people don't think in terms of custody. If your bank were to, their app goes down, your money is still technically safe and people think in that that term. But when it comes to cryptographic keys, it's not always the case. So, It's true. I mean, the, the, the thing, it's the thing right now with exchanges, I mean, they all have like kind of this crypto insurance. Mm -hmm. When you look at the fine print, they say, right, your, your funds are insured, right? But when you look at the fine print, you realize that they insure a fraction of the funds mm -hmm. because they don't have the capacity or the insurer doesn't have the capacity to insure everything. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. The second thing, there is like so, all sorts of exclusions and the payment terms are not very clear. Not, you don't know exactly how. So what we are bringing here, a solution where 100% of the funds will be made immediately available to everyone. So this is unprecedented. There is no equivalent solution today on the market. And uh, it's, I think it's quite unique to the way we have set up everything. Got it. So you also said earlier when you were speaking about the, you know, the scheme that, that's happening behind the scenes in Zengo that this is also a passwordless. And so I think yes. people who are still you know, working through in their, in their minds and if you're listening or you're watching, definitely download the app, give it a try and see if it's something that you're interested in. Ultimately, with a passwordless scheme, how are you doing authentication for users on their phones to track? Sure. So that's where the magic of uh, the uh, distribution of the security happens and the server uh, plays a role. So everyone is familiar with 2FA, mm -hmm. right? The second factor authentication, which usually is a rotating password or can be also a, a YubiKey or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we have introduced what we call 3FA three-factor authentication, mm -hmm. where none of them rely on uh, on a password that a user has to memorize. So the process is extremely simple to explain. Okay. Uh, a, you will have to input your email, just your email, no login, uh, no password, just email, and you will receive a magic link. This magic link is a very sophisticated behind the scene password scheme, but the bottom line is you do not have to know this password. It's changing all the time as long as you own the email. Mm -hmm. Number two, you arrive to your device, right? And it links back to your device, and you grant access to um, to the phone um, to the phone security, which is usually device biometrics and everything. Yeah. And by way of doing that, you also grant access 
to a file which uh, we will talk about after if you want, but that will also host one of the decryption keys that you control uh, for, um, for, for the process, but you don't see that. Yes, right? it's behind so the scenes. Grant, mm -hmm. And the third step, you will have to, um, so, and this is also a major innovation, we have not invented it, we're not the first company to do that, but probably the first in crypto, we are asking you to do an encrypted face map. So it's not face ID. Mm -hmm. It's not something that is built on your phone. It's, uh, you just need a selfie camera. And basically, it does an encrypted mathematical representation of your face, meaning that no one, including us, see it or can even use it. It's on your phone. Mm -hmm. And this encrypted version knows that it's you. And it's stand, sent back to, uh, in the, to our server in an encrypted way. So again, we cannot uh, see who you are, and mm -hmm. we cannot even use it. So, right. so that's the, that, those are the three steps, and then your account is set up. But that sounds like long, but it's like tac 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 tac, and your account is set. You okay. got your public keys, and you can you good to go. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit more. So, if you're you've completed those three steps, you have an email, you have your biometrics, and you've given access to the onboard security on your phone. How many of those would an attacker need to get access to your account? So what would the attack what would the attack vector look like for a hacker? If they were to get this magic link, are you cooked or is are the other the other pieces there to protect you? You need three of them. Three three FA, three factors of authentication. Okay, cool. So as as long as you don't have so that's also the beauty of it. Like you know, the problem with like for example, SIM jacking or SIM swapping. Mm -hmm. uh, once you had one of the elements of factor it was game over so someone controls your email mm -hmm. okay it's game over because you can like reset the password the 2fa whatever here if someone entirely controls your email entirely cannot do a thing to recover your account on zango can't impossible okay, okay? Uh, i mean nothing is impossible it would be really 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 hard and really really expensive like we're talking nation state impossible right so okay. that's kind of the degree of difficulty. So, so, so this is protect. This protects the user. Uh, but the beauty of it is that it's the first financial system in the world where only the owner can access his account. If you think about it, any kind of hardware wallet or private key wallet can be used by anyone who has your private key. Right? If I have your private key, I can do anything that I want, and that's how hackers are having fun. Yeah. On Zango. If I have your email, if I have your cloud access or whatever, there's no way you need three factors. Can you have them? Sure, you can have them. Can physically threaten you, so that's kind of an attack vector. Yes. And ask you to send the funds, but that's an attack vector that would work with virtually anything. Because yeah. from the moment that I know that you own crypto, and I put a gun on your face, no matter how much you protect them and you hide them, believe me, at this moment, you will give whatever they want to save your life. Yeah. So, so the plausible deniability doesn't save psychological factors. So the point is, uh, except in case of physical attacks and under duress, like any other system, uh, mm -hmm. and even for that we have protections coming soon, uh, the, the attack vector are extremely limited compared to password-based systems. Got it. So also I think then going back, you know, back to the, the, original, the original three factors, Biometrics, I think, is a hot, it's a super hot topic. And I personally, I am a fan of biometrics. I think that biometrics are an important part of solid, of solid authentication schemes because it's just one extra tool for either entropy or for true authentication. Yes. In terms of your, your biometric scheme, so you're not using the, the face ID per se because that would lock you into using the iPhone only. Um, how does your algorithm work? Is it using like multi-point and then a calculation, like an algorithm that's built into your, your client application uh, or is something else going on behind the scenes there? Yeah, so, so first on Face ID, we could not use it, not just because it could lock you in iPhone, it's because Face ID is not ported when you change to a new phone. Mm -hmm. So there would be no way to recognize you, mm -hmm. right? If you buy a new iPhone, and you do Face ID without setting it up, the phone doesn't know you. So that's yeah. impossible to use Face ID specific to the device that you want. So right. we, had some, we had something that could run uh, without the logic of the device and could be platform, platform agnostic. Mm -hmm. So the way 
the, the biometric works. And it's, very, it's a very hot topic. As you said, it's one of the most popular questions that we get. But once people get it and verify it, uh, they get they, they feel comfortable with it. So A, it's not relying on how you look like. Mm -hmm. Okay, So it's not relying on likeness. Meaning, if you have a picture of you or a video of you or even a 3D mask, I could show you. We have a 3D mask of, of me. I have a video on YouTube that's showing that. That will not work. Okay. okay? So it's relying on liveness. So liveness is a, is, a, is a science. It's highly documented. There's a lot of math behind it. It's actually looking as how your face is alive and looking like you. Right? So the fact that your eyes are moving, your mouth is moving, that you're the position of your body, all these kind of things. All of that is done on the device, encrypted on the device. It's extremely important because people like, like have privacy nightmares always. And yeah. It's true. We wouldn't want to know that. So it's happening on the device. And so, so once you first enroll, we, we do like this face map to encrypt it. And once the day you recover, it compares this original face map with the, the new scan, right? And so the liveness is compared. Mm -hmm. And so there is a highly documented, uh, uh, it's a very hard to explain in just in a few words, but it's like very sophisticated how it's done. And the, the, the interesting part that we've introduced into the wallet is as soon as you've done it, you can immediately verify it. So you can take, for example, the face of whatever friend and say, all right, let's see now you, this is bullshit and I can log in with my friend. Yeah. And you see immediately that it's failing. We had people on the internet trying to break us, right? Or to show that the system was breakable with a picture or whatever, but it, it, it just doesn't. It's also been batted, tested on millions and millions of users. So by now, if the if picture or video would break it, we would know. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very sophisticated system. But it's also very simple. People understand it. Not everyone is familiar with it, so we, we mm -hmm. get that. Uh, but the advantage is that it brings, uh, supersedes uh, the alternatives. Right. Yeah. And, and I think people, when Face ID came out on iPhones, people were not very comfortable with the yeah. concept of your face. And there were all these reports saying you can trick it. Same with yeah. the iris scan on Samsung devices. And even the fingerprint scanner early on, people were saying someone can lift it create a silicone copy and they can unlock your phone, right? So I think biometrics have been challenged from the very beginning. Yeah. But I think the best way of going about it is making it one part of a multi-part scheme exactly. so that you can, tr you, you can trust each component a little bit more because it's exactly. not... Exactly. You, you can also verify them. And it's true. The media narrative around biometrics, in particular, mass authentication, mm -hmm. sorry, mass recognition, yes. is often confused with one-on-one -on -one authentication. So we do not do, we do not use like this clear view stuff or like do like mass recognition, and cameras yeah. everywhere. We do opt-in only one-on-one uh, -on -one authentication. Encrypted authentication is very, very different. And so once you, you get that, you understand the model. And by the way, I think it's going to be the future. If you think about the number of disasters that have happened because of either passwords or even bad 2FA setups. Mm -hmm. Because people use a Google Authenticator, didn't get that they had to recover it somewhere and, and back it up and, every, and lost everything. I think this is just going to go that direction. I agree. I'm a huge, huge advocate of best practice for 2FA uh, out there. And for folks that are watching, if you have a bank or you have a, even a consumer account that the customer support tells you, hey, just use the SMS. It's fine. Yeah. Close the account. It, it's bye not bye. worth it. Yeah. It's <laughs> not worth it. It's not worth it. And any, yeah, any wallet or any like, thing that the second you see a mobile phone number, you should run away. Yeah. And, and a lot of times, too, companies, they don't, it's extra overhead for them. So they don't want to push this to you. But if you call yeah. them and you pressure them, they will give you physical tokens or they will give you the ability to use an app. I'm partial to the YubiKey multi-factor because I think that's great um, with yeah. a, a key. But yes, call and put pressure on, on any account that is not giving this to you right now. Just a, yes. a, a little tip. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and that's actually where I wanted to go next is, is talk about YubiKey briefly. Is there any uh, plan or thought or did you guys consider adding YubiKey as, as a component of this authentication scheme like a physical piece of hardware or do you think uh, there's so, plenty so we, we, we could we could um, uh, we're looking at all sorts of possibilities right now around this world mm -hmm. 
we can add additional signatures, a uh, type of signatures which will come from human beings, from parties, from companies, from devices, um, and this working on any blockchain, again, so Bitcoin to Tezos to whatever. Um, so we're looking into it very seriously. Mm -hmm. And so you will have additional um, signatures that will be available that will add comfort and trust and security and safety. It will add a little bit of complexity uh, to that. Certainly. But we have also a pretty groundbreaking idea that I, I cannot disclose today. Uh, but sure. that would be a pretty game changer in terms of security if we manage to crack it. So we're still working on it. Sure. There are good chances we will. And uh, if we will, we will talk about it. <laughs> so I would, be, I would be letting my audience down if I did not see if I could get you to give us a hint on what it is you're working on. Well, you can try. But it's, it's about increasing your, uh, the security of all your financial services. And so um, not just that of Zango. It would also increase that of Zango. And so the idea is to... You know, the way to think about that is to say the access or the, 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 the authentication is a form of asset, right? So mm -hmm. Bitcoin is an asset, Ethereum is an asset, it's a digital asset. But accessing the access of something is a digital asset, mm -hmm. right? It's something digital that has ownership and that allows you as value because it gives you access to something that has value. So we think that this is one of the properties of a wallet. And we think we can bring that to the world. Very interesting. Well, I think we have another excuse to, uh, to talk about it once you guys get there. Let's see. Let's see. Awesome. And so I think for folks that are wondering right now, um, where can they find your app? I, I know I said early on, but I want to make sure that I've covered the bases. Where can they find Zengo? On the Play Store and the App Store, Zengo, uh, Zengo.com, uh, at Zengo on Twitter. Um, it's available right there. Um, and you will see it. the app does what it says. Uh, very simple to sign up, send, receive, buy in 40 countries. Okay. Uh, and you can earn anywhere in the world uh, and stake anywhere in the world. Yeah, and that's, that's, pr that's a pretty big feature. I know it's recent, uh, being able to stake and use earn products anywhere in the world because I think a lot of platforms are, are rolling that out, but it's limited by geography yeah. very heavily. Um, yeah. So it's, it's you, have to pay, you have to KYC. And yeah. They have all sorts of restrictions on how much you can deposit and withdraw. Here, there is it's available everywhere. No minimum, no lockup, no no constraints. It's available everywhere. So that that topic is is great that you brought that up. What is what's your stance on KYC in the space and in regards to Zengo, where you guys play in that? So I have a hybrid opinion about it. I think it should not be mandatory for small transactions and small operations. Mm -hmm. I think there should be a KYC-less uh, financial world for anything that is minor. So the, the threshold, I don't know exactly how to define it, but you cannot imagine a world where for doing a $5 operation, you need to go through a, a KYC process which costs $20. It I makes agree. no sense. Yes. Uh, so that's that. The second is for large operations or committed operations, you obviously want to protect or prevent the risk of abuse and fraud. Mm -hmm. But you want also to be compliant with the law, right? We all live in society. We've signed a, a social contract to live in societies. So we have to pay taxes. We have to uh, abide by certain laws so we are not criminals. And so doing a KYC is a good thing. What I do not like about KYC right now is that the process is often tedious. Yes. And that all those companies that are doing KYC, you have absolutely no idea what they do with your data, where it is stored, uh, where, where, you know, it's like a major honeypot and talking about the exchanges for money, right? But, yeah. but these KYC companies, they know everything about everyone and you don't know what's happening. So everyone does it thinking like, okay, all right, send my passport, I send my ID, I send my address. But think about what these informations are and where they are stored. So yeah. this is what I don't like about KYC. I wish this could change there, that you would have like a user control KYC where you can delegate the information at the moment it's required and then it's cleared and then that's it, right? Yes. Uh, and it can be retrieved as needed, updated as needed. And this does, that does not exist today. So we still like in version zero of KYC. I would agree totally. And 
there are so many platforms that that require KYC and I completely understand why they require KYC. There's no doubt yeah. and I completely understand. I think the issue is now that as every platform has their own individual KYC process, you're now encouraging users if they want to use your great service to give their information yet again. And so the more copies yes. that you put out there in the world of your personal information, the wider your attack vector is, right? And that's, that, that's, that's the biggest issue. That's a major, major issue. So, you know, so what I hope is that the world will evolve with the regulator supporting it to a KYC-less world for small transactions, yeah. a KYC world for committed transactions, but where the KYC is protecting the user and is controlled by the user mm -hmm. and compliant with the law. And I think if that happened, there would be much less resistance and critique about it. I agree. And I would hope that maybe one day we can reach a world where at scale and with property, you know, security properties that are required, we could use a zero knowledge proof style um, attestation scheme to attest to these sorts of things. You know, when you go yes. to the when you go to a bar and you want to prove, hey, I'm over 21, you know, beard helps, you know, gray hair would help. Right. Those things. But if they I'm ask, for sure. <laughs> yeah, there you go. They, they ask you for your ID and this random person, they can see your eye color, your height, your address, whatever's yes. on your ID, they have access to with complete, you know, complete freedom. And all they really need to know is, are you 21? So in a world where we yeah. can you, use zero knowledge proofs to attest that, you can prove that you're 21 without exposing any information about you. They don't need to know your exact birthday, just that what they're asking is true. They would, it would need to be technically possible, but not just. It would, be, it would, need, it would need for it to be embraced by the regulator. Yes. Because if it's not, if it's just a beautiful technical solution, no one is going to implement it because they need to... Co the people who do KYC, they don't do it because they, it's nice and they usually don't make money out of it. They do it to protect the la own liability yeah. that the, the regulator come after them and say, you have enabled criminals to do mm -hmm. whatever. So, so if the regulator does not embrace it, it's going to be a problem. So it has to be a technical solution that is sold to the regulator or that is used by the regulator. Yeah, it no, take I, time before it happens. I agree, and it would it'll also require the regulators to participate actively. You know, whoever you know in the U.S. when your license, your driver's license is issued to you, it's issued to you by your your Department of Motor Vehicles. They'd have to participate as an an attester of your information. So right. it will take time, but I think it's possible. And I think the more that these types of conversations happen, which I enjoy immensely, um, people will start to think about the art of the possible in this regard. And, and think about it. Something that would make it even more interesting is if the documents themselves were digital assets mm -hmm. stored in your wallet, right? Yeah. But pointing to a finger here, <laughs> stored in a wallet, and then you can build zero knowledge proofs on those digital assets which are identifying you so the regulator would issue those digital assets they would have a cryptographic proof that they are who you are and that they exist and the wallet could actually um, be the kyc for what you whatever you need and they are user controlled so it's not different from sending a bitcoin transaction mm -hmm. or whatever uh, so i think you know the, the world will go there it will take time but that, that sounds to me like the right direction yeah, I would totally agree. I hope that hope that one day we get there. I, I don't see why why we wouldn't, but uh, you know, obviously it's going to take people to build it and to work with coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, it's going to take it's going to take time and it's going to take effort. But I think the future is bright in this regard. It's really cool to be a part of the space and watching this stuff get built in real time. It's true. I mean, it's super exciting. I mean. Personally, I wish, and I've seen, you know, a few revolutions in, in tech, I wish things were going a bit faster, not at the tech point of view, because I think we're actually, a lot is happening, actually too much, yeah. but more at the regulator point of view, because they definitely not, don't go at tech speed. And they actually are going at a speed that hurts the industry, mm -hmm. prevents it from growing, and prevents it from uh, basically getting its legitimacy and its true foundation for development. And so this is really, for right now, for me, the biggest attack vector on the industry is the lack of regulation, embracement, and, and adoption. And clarity, for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think we've gone through quite a bit of, of interesting stuff today. 
Um, I did want to give you a quick opportunity to uh, to close. If there's anything that you wanted to bring people's attention to that we didn't get to, um, feel free. No, I mean, that, that was pretty great. One thing we like to do, and it's always surprising, is we, we always say to people, do not try Zango first. We like them to try any other wallet, any of our competitors, mm -hmm. and then come to us so that they realize that it's easier to play the violin without box box gloves, right? So mm -hmm. it's like like breathing afterwards. So use any wallet, try it, and tell us what you what you want. We, we just launched recently, so we still have a lot to do, but uh, please send us feedback. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to leave feedback in the comments below, I can collate it up, send it over to the team here. Uh, and That'd be awesome. Yeah, I think it really helps it really helps grow these types of products, getting feedback from real users and, you know, getting your test feedback as well. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much, Oriel, for taking the time. Uh, I'm really happy we got to connect after uh, getting this thing scheduled. So yes. thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Cheers, everybody, and have a great one.